Hello everybody, I hope you're having a really wonderful day or morning, evening, whatever it is for you, where you are. So I'm going to be reading a story for you today. Um, it is by Chuck Palahniuk. He's one of my favorite authors. Very, uh, very knowledgeable man. And, um, it's going to be a story from his novel, Haunted, which, if you are unfamiliar with it, you should definitely check it out. It's good shit. So, I don't really want to give too much of an introduction, give too much away about the book itself. I'm probably going to cherry-pick a few stories from it, because there's uh, 23 separate stories within the book. And again, I don't want to say too much about the book itself, but, you know, I'm probably going to pick a few of the stories from the book, a few of my favorites, and read them to you, but I encourage you to actually go check out the full book. It's very, very much worth a read. So, without further ado, I'll just get right to it. Alright, so this is Hot Potter. A story by Baroness Frostbite. Come February nights, Miss Leroy used to say, and every drunk driver was a blessing. Every couple looking for a second honeymoon to patch up their marriage. People falling asleep at the steering wheel. Anybody who pulled off the highway for a drink. They were somebody Miss Leroy could maybe talk into renting a room. It was half her business talking, to keep people buying another next drink, and another, until they had to stay. Sometimes, sure, you're trapped. Other times, Miss Leroy would say, you would just sit down for what turns out to be the rest of your life. Rooms there at the lodge, most people, they expect better. The iron bed frames teeter, the rails and footboards worn where they notch together. The nuts and bolts, loose. Upstairs, every mattress is lumpy as foothills and the pillows are flat. The sheets are clean, but the well water up here, it's hard. You wash anything in this water, and the fabric feels sandpaper rough with minerals and smells of sulfur. The final insult is you have to share a bathroom down the hall. Most folks don't travel with a bathrobe. And this means getting dressed just to take a leak. In the morning, you wake up to a stinking sulfur bath in a white, cold, cast-iron clawfoot tub. It's a pleasure for her to herd these February strangers toward the cliff. First, she shuts off the music. A full hour before she even starts talking, she turns down the volume, a notch every ten minutes, until Glen Campbell is gone. After traffic turns to nothing going by on the road outside, she turns down the heat. One by one, she pulls the string that snaps off each neon beer sign in the window. If there's been a fire in the fireplace, Miss Leroy will let it burn out. All this time, she's hurting, asking what plans these people have. February on the White River, there's less than nothing to do. Snowshoe, maybe. Cross-country ski if you bring your own. Miss Leroy lets guests bring up the idea. Everybody gets around to the same suggestion. And if they don't, then she brings up the notion of hot potting. Her Stations of the Cross. She walks her audience through the roadmap of her story. First, she shows herself how she looked most of her life ago, 20 years old and out of college for the summer, car camping up the White River, begging for a summer job, what back then was the dream job, tending bar here at the lodge. It's hard to imagine Miss Leroy skinny, her skinny with white teeth, before her gums started to pull back. Before the way they look now, the brown root of each tooth exposed, the way carrots will crowd each other out of the ground if you plant the seed too close together. 
it's hard to imagine her voting Democrat, even liking other people. Miss Leroy, without the dark shadow of hair across her top lip, it's hard to imagine college boys waiting an hour in line to fuck her. It makes her seem honest, saying something funny and sad like that about herself. It makes people listen. If you hugged her now, Miss Leroy says, all you'd feel is the pointy wire of her bra. Hot potting, she says, is you get a gang of kids together and hike up the fault side of the White River. You pack in your own beer and whiskey and find a hot springs pool. Most pools stand between 150 and 200 degrees year-round. Up at this elevation, water boils at 198 degrees Fahrenheit. Even in winter, at the bottom of a deep icy pit, the side of snowdrifts sloping into them, these pools are hot enough to boil you alive. No, the danger wasn't bears, not here. You wouldn't see wolves or coyote or bobcat. Downriver, yes. Just one click away on your odometer, just one radio song down the highway, the motels had to chain their garbage cans shut. Down there, the snow was busy with paw prints. The night was noisy with packs howling at the moon. But here, the snow was smooth. Even the full moon was quiet. Upriver from the lodge, all you had to worry about was being scolded to death. City kids dropped out of college. Some stay around a couple years. Some way, they pass down to be... They pass down the okay about which pools are safe and where to find them. Where not to walk. There's only a thin crust of calcium or limestone center that looks like bedrock, but will drop you through to deep fry in a hidden thermal vent. The scare stories they pass along also. A hundred years back, a Mrs. Lester Bannock, here visiting from Crystal Falls, Pennsylvania, she stopped to wipe, to wipe the steam from her smoked glasses. The breeze shifted, blowing hot steam in her eyes. One wrong step and she was off the path. Another wrong step and she lost her balance, landing backwards, sitting in water, scalding hot. Trying to stand, she pitched forward, landing face down in the water. Screaming, she was hauled out by strangers. The sheriff who raced her into town, he requisitioned every drop of olive oil from the kitchen at the lodge. Coated in oil and wrapped in clean sheets, she died in a hospital, still screaming three days later. Recent as three summers ago, a kid from Pinson City, Wyoming, he parked his pickup truck and out-jumped his German Shepherd, the dog splashed dead center, jumping into a pool and yelped itself to death in mid-dog paddle. The tourists chewing their knuckles, they told the kid don't, but he dove in. He surfaced just once, his eyes boiled white and staring, rolling around blind. No one could touch him long enough to grab hold, and then he was gone. The rest of that year, they dipped him out with nets, the way you'd clean leaves and dead bugs out of a swimming pool, the way you'd skim the fat off of a pot of stew. At the lodge bar, Miss Leroy would pause to let people see this a moment in their heads, the bits of him left all summer skittering around in the hot water, a batch of fritters spitting to a light brown. Miss Leroy would smoke her cigarette, then like this is something she just remembered she'd say, Olson Reed, and she'd laugh, like this is something she doesn't think about, part of every minute, every hour she's awake, Miss Leroy will say, you should have met Olson Reed. Big, fat, virtuous, sin-free Olson Reed. Olson was a cook at the lodge fat and pale white, his lips too big, blown up with blood and squirming red as sushi against the sticky white skin of his face. He watched those hot pools, the way he'd kneel beside them all day, watching it, the bubbling brown froth hot as acid. One wrong step, 
one quick slide down the wrong side of a snow drift, and just hot water would do to you what Olson did to food. Poached salmon, stewed chicken and dumplings, hard-boiled eggs. In the lodge kitchen, Olson used to sing hymns so loud you could hear them in the dining room. Olson, huge in his flapping white apron, the ties knotted and cutting into his thick, deep waist, he sat in the bar, reading his Bible in the almost dark. The beer and smoke smell of the dark red carpet. If he joined your table in the staff break room, Olson bowed his head to his chest and said a rambling blessing over his bologna sandwich. His favorite verb was fellowship. A night when Olson walked into the pantry and found Miss Leroy kissing a bellhop, just some liberal arts dropout from NYU, Olson Reed told them kissing was the devil's first step to fornication. With his rubbery red lips, Olson told everyone he was saving himself for marriage, but the truth was he couldn't give himself away. To Olson, the White River was his Garden of Eden, the proof his God did beautiful work. Olson watched the hot springs, the geysers, and steaming mud pots the way every Christian loves the idea of hell, the way every Eden had to have its snake. He watched the scalding water steam and spit, the same way he'd peek through the order window and watch the waitresses in the dining room. On his day off, he'd carry his Bible through the woods, through the clouds and the fog of sulfur. He'd be singing Amazing Grace, or Nearer My God to Thee, but only the fifth or sixth verses, the parts so strange and unknown, you might think he made them up. Walking on the center, the thin crust of calcium that forms the way ice sets up on water, Olson would step off the boardwalk and kneel at the deep edge of a spitting, stinking pool. Kneeling there, he'd pray out loud for Miss Leroy and the bellhop. He'd pray to his Lord, our God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. He'd pray for the immortal soul of each busboy by name. He'd inventory the sins of each hotel maid out loud. Olson's voice rising with the steam, he prayed for Nola, who pinned up the hem of her skirt too high, and committed the act of oral sex with any hotel guest willing to cut loose a twenty-dollar bill. The tourist family standing back, safe on the boardwalk behind him, Olson begged mercy for the dining room waiters. Evan and Leo, who assaulted each other with lewd acts of sodomy every night in the men's dorm. Olsen wept and shouted about Dewey and Buddy, who breathed glue from a brown paper bag while they washed the dishes. There at the gates of his hell, Olsen yelled opinions into the trees and sky. Making his report to God, Olsen walked out after dinner shift and shouted your sins at the stars so bright they bled together in the night. He begged for God's mercy on your behalf. No, nobody very much liked Olson Reed. Nobody any age likes a tattletale. They'd all heard the stories about the woman wrapped in olive oil. The kid cooked soup with his dog. And Olson especially would listen, his eyes bright as candy. This was proof of everything he held dear. The truth of this, proof you can't hide what you've done from God. You can't fix it. We'd be awake and alive in hell, but hurting so bad, we'd wish we could die. We'd spend all eternity suffering someplace no one in the world would trade us to be. Here, it would be. Miss Leroy would stop talking. She'd light a new cigarette. She'd draw you another beer. Some stories, she'd say, the more you tell them, the faster you use them up. Those kind... The drama burns off, and every version they sound more silly and flat. The other kind of story, it uses you up. The more you tell it, the stronger it gets. Those kinds of stories only remind you how stupid you were, are, will always be. Telling some stories, Miss Leroy says, is committing suicide. It's here that she'd work hard to make the story boring, saying how water heated to 158 degrees Fahrenheit causes a third-degree burn in one second. 
The typical thermal feature along the White River Fault is a vent that opens to a pool crusted around the edge with a layer of, of that crystallized mineral. The average temperature of thermal features along the White River being 205 degrees Fahrenheit. One second in water this hot and pulling your socks off will pull off your feet. The cooked skin of your hands will stick to anything you touch and stay behind, perfect as a pair of leather gloves. Your body tries to save itself by shifting fluid to the burn to dissipate the heat. Your sweat, dehydrating faster than the worst case of diarrhea, losing so much fluid, your blood pressure drops. You go into shock. Your vital organs shut down in rapid succession. Burns can be first degree, second, third, or fourth degree. They can be superficial, partial thickness, or full thickness burns. In superficial or first degree burns, the skin turns red without blistering. Think of a sunburn and the subsequent desquamation of ne necrotic tissue, the dead peeling skin. In full thickness, third degree burns, you get the dry white leather look of a knuckle that bumps the top heating element when you take a cake out of the oven. In fourth degree burns, you're cooked worse than skin deep. To determine the extent of a burn, the medical examiner will use the rule of nines. The head is 9% of the body's total skin. Each arm is 9%. Each leg is 18%. The torso, front, and back are each 18%. 1% for the neck, and you get the whole 100%. Swallowing even a mouthful of water this hot causes edema of the larynx and asphyxial death. Your throat swells shut and you choke to death. It's poetry to hear Miss Leroy spin this out. Skeletonization, skin slippage. <laughs> oh, geez, I even slipped up here. Hypokalemia? Long words that take everybody in the bar to safe abstracts far, far away. It's a nice little break in her story before facing the worst. You can spend your whole life building a wall of facts between you and anything real. A February night just like this, most of her life ago, Miss Leroy and Olson, the cook, were the only people in the lodge that night. The day before dropped three feet of new snow and the plows hadn't come through yet. The same as every night, Olson Reed takes his Bible in one fat hand and goes tramping off into the snow. Back then, they had coyotes to worry about, cougar and bobcat. Singing Amazing Grace for a mile, never repeating a verse, Olsen tramps off white against the white snow. The two lanes of Highway 17, lost under snow. The neon sign saying, The Lodge, in green neon. Freestanding on a steel pole, anchored in concrete with a low brick planter around the base of it. The outside world, like every night. Is moonlight black and blue, the forest just dark pine trees shaped stretched up. Young and thin, Miss Leroy never gave Olson Reed a second thought, never realized how long he was gone until she heard the wolves start to howl. She was looking at her teeth, holding a polished butter knife so she could see how straight and white her teeth looked. She was used to hearing Olson shout each night his voice shouting her name followed by a sin, real or imagined, that came from the woods. She smoked cigarettes, Olsen shouted. She slow danced, Olsen screamed at God on her behalf. Telling the story now, she'll make you tweeze the rest of it out of her. The idea of her trapped here, her soul in limbo. Nobody comes to the lodge planning to stay the rest of their life. Hell, Miss Leroy says. There's things you see happen worse than getting killed. There's things that happen worse than a car accident that leave you stranded, worse than breaking an axle when you're young and you're left tending bar in some little no place for the rest of your life. More than half her life ago, Miss Leroy hears the wolves howl, the coyotes yip. She hears Olson screaming, not her name or any sin, but just screaming. She goes to the dining room side door. She steps out, 
leaning out over the snow and turns her head sideways to listen. She smells Olson before she can see him. It's the smell of breakfast, of bacon frying in the cold air, the smell of bacon or spam, sliced thick and hissing crisp on its own hot fat. At this point in her story, the electric wall heater always comes on. That moment, the moment the room's got as cold as it can get. Ms. Leroy knows that moment, can feel it make the hair stand up on her top lip. She knows when to stop a second, to leave a little away of quiet, and then boom, the rush and wail of warm air out of the heater. The fan makes a low moan, far away at first, then up close, loud. Miss Leroy makes sure it bar room's dark by now. The heater comes on, the low moan of it, and people look up. All they can see in the window is their own reflection, their own faces not recognized. Looking inside at them is a pale mask full of dark holes. The mouth is a hanging open dark hole. Their own eyes, two close together staring black holes through to the night behind them. The car is parked just outside. They look a hundred cold miles away. Even the parking lot looks too far to walk in this kind of dark. The face of Olson Reed, when she found him, his neck and head, this last ten percent of him was still perfect, beautiful even, compared to the peeling, boiled food rest of his body, still screaming, as if the stars give a shit, this something left of Olsen dragging itself down this side of the white river it stumbled, knees wobbly, staggering and coming apart. There were parts of Olsen already gone, his legs below his knees cooked and drug off over the broken ice, bit and pulled off the skin first and then the bones, the blood so cooked inside there's nothing going off behind him but a trail of his own grease, his heat melting deep in the snow. The kid from Pinson City, Wyoming, the kid who jumped in to save his dog, Folks say that when the crowd pulled him out, his arms popped apart, joint by joint, but he was still alive. His scalp peeled back off his white skull, but he was still awake. The surface of the seething water had spit hot and sparkling rainbow colors from the kid's rendered fat, the grease of him floating on the surface. The kid's dog boiled down to a perfect dog-shaped fur coat, its bones already cooked clean and settling into the deep geothermal center of the world. The kid's last words were, I fucked up. I can't fix this, can I? That's how Miss Leroy found Olsen Reed that night, but worse. The snow behind him, the fresh powder all around him, it was cut with drool. All around his screams fanned out around behind him. Miss Leroy could see a swarm of yellow eyes. The snow stamped down to ice and the prints of coyote feet. The four-toe prints of wolf paws. Floating around him were the long skull faces of wild dogs. Panting behind their own white breath, their black lips curled up along the ridge of each, m each snout. Their little root teeth meshed together, tight tugging back on the rags of Olsen's white pants, the shredded pant legs still streaming from what boiled alive inside. The next heartbeat, the yellow eyes are gone, and what's left of Olsen is what's left. Snow kicked up by back feet, it still sparkles in the air. The two of them, in the warm cloud of bacon smell, Olsen pulsed with heat, a big baked potato sinking deeper into the snow beside her. His skin was crusted now, puckered and rough as fried chicken, but loose and slippery on top of the muscle underneath, the muscle twisting, cooked around the core of worn bone. His hands clamped tight around her, around Miss Leroy's fingers, but when she tried to pull away, his skin tore. His cooked hands stuck the way your lips freeze to the flagpole on the playground in cold weather. When she tried to pull away, her fingers split to the bone, baked and bloodless inside. Oh, shit, I'm sorry, his fingers. <laughs> and he screamed and gripped Miss Leroy tight. 
He was too heavy to move, sunk there in the snow. She was anchored there, the side door to the dining room only twenty footprints away in the snow. The door was still open, and the tables inside set for the next meal. Miss Leroy could see the dining room's big stone mountain of a fireplace, the logs burning inside. She could watch, but it was too far away to feel. She swam with her feet, kicking, trying to drag Olsen, but the snow was too deep. Instead of moving, she stayed, hoping he would die, praying to God to kill Olsen Reed before she froze. The wolves watching with their yellow eyes from the dark edge of the forest, the pine tree shapes going up into the night sky, the stars above them bleeding together. That night, Olsen Reed told her a story, his own private ghost story. When we die, these are the stories still on our lips. The stories will only tell strangers, someplace private in the padded cell of midnight. These important stories, we rehearse them for years in our head, but we never tell. These stories are ghosts bringing people back from the dead, just for a moment, for a visit. Every story is a ghost. This story is Olsen's. Melting snow in her mouth, Miss Leroy spit the water into Olsen's fat red lips, his face the only part of him that she could touch without getting stuck. Kneeling there beside him, the devil's first step to fornication, that kiss, the moment Olsen had saved himself for. For most of her life, she never told anyone about what he yelled. Holding this inside was such a burden. Now she tells everyone, and it's no better. That boiled, sad thing up the white river, it screamed. Why did you do this? It screamed. What did I do? Timber wolves, Miss Leroy says, and she laughs. We don't have that trouble. Not here, she says. Not anymore. How Olsen died, it's called myoglobulinaria. In extensive burns, the burned muscles release the protein myoglobulin. This flood of protein into the bloodstream overwhelms each kidney. The kidneys shut down and the body fills with fluid and blood toxins. Renal failure, myoglobulinaria. When Miss Leroy says these words, she could be a magician doing a trick. They could be a spell, an incantation. This way to die takes all night. The next morning, the snowplow came through. The driver found them, Olsen Reed dead and Miss Leroy asleep. From melting snow in her mouth all night, her gums were patched with white, frostbite. R Reed's dead hands were still locked around hers, protecting her fingers, warm as a pair of gloves. For weeks, the frozen skin around the base of each tooth, it peeled away, soft and gray from the brown roots, until her teeth looked the way they do, until her lips were gone. Desquamating necrotic tissue, another magic spell. There's nothing out in the woods, Miss Leroy would tell people. Nothing evil. It's just something so sad and alone. It's Olsen Reed not knowing still what he did wrong, not knowing where he's at, so terrible and alone. Even the wolves, the coyotes are gone from up that end of the White River. That's how a scary story works. It echoes some ancient fear. It recreates some forgotten terror, something we'd like to think we've grown beyond, but it can still scare us to tears. It's something you'd hoped has healed. Every night scattered with them, these wandering people who can't be saved but won't die. You hear them at night, screaming out there, up this side of the White River Fault. Some February nights, there's still the smell of hot grease, crisp bacon. Olsen Reed not feeling his legs but still getting tugged back, him screaming. His fingers hooked claws into the snow, getting tugged back into the dark by all those clenched 
little see you